Hello everyone, my name is Charlie Heaps and I'm a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute and today I want to talk to you about the role of modelling in climate change mitigation planning and in particular the way that SEI's LEAP software can be used for that task. So first of all I want to say a few words about where modelling can be useful in the climate planning process. So generally mitigation modelling is thought of as a separate and quite distinct task in the climate planning process. You know we're used to thinking about inventories, mitigation and adaptation as quite distinct tasks. But I would say that it's more useful to think of mitigation modelling as being something that is carried out throughout the climate planning process and it can be very useful in helping to guide and manage many of the other tasks in the climate planning process. And in particular, mitigation modelling has very strong connections to other tasks, to greenhouse gas inventories, to data collection, to setting goals and targets, to the measurement, reporting and verification process, and also it can be involved in stakeholder engagement and outreach. So I think it's best to think of the climate planning process not as a linear process, but rather as a very non-linear and iterative process. And mitigation analysis can really be very useful sort of within the centre of that process. So let me mention a few particular connections between the different elements of the climate planning process. So first of all, mitigation modelling needs to be informed by and very closely calibrated to any greenhouse gas inventories that are going on. Obviously, mitigation analysis is very reliant on data collection, but there's also a feedback. It can also be the mitigation process itself and the modelling process itself can be very useful in helping to set priorities for improving data. So, for example, as a result of doing the modelling, that can help you identify key sources. It can help you identify which of those sources might be growing the fastest. And it can also help clarify where your biggest data gaps are. So it can help you prioritise improving your data collection. So there's a feedback between the mitigation modelling and the inventories in the data collection. Obviously, also, the modelling can help to establish the priority policies and measures that you might be thinking of pursuing in terms of your climate change mitigation process. So there's a very strong connection there between the, the setting of goals and the modelling. You know, you might have an initial set of goals and the modelling might help illustrate how achievable those goals are, whether you're being too ambitious or not ambitious enough. It can also be very closely connected to the tasks of measurement, uh, reporting and verification. In particular, if it's set up correctly, the modelling itself can be a tool in helping to monitor the success of the implementation of your uh, mitigation measures. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the right modelling tools can also be very useful in helping to communicate strategies and engage with stakeholders. So there's not a simple top-down process of setting goals. You know, low emission development strategies are really reliant on getting the wider community involved and getting them engaged in what kind of future energy systems they want. And the modelling, if done correctly, can help to illustrate the the implications of different mitigation scenarios. So what might be the development benefits? What might be some of the downsides? What, what might be some of the co-benefits, perhaps, for example, reducing air pollution as well as in reducing uh, climate change emissions? So the mitigation modelling can help to set your goals and targets, not just for greenhouse gases, but also for co-benefits. And it can help illustrate some of the wider sustainable development goals that you're interested in. So overall, mitigation modelling can help keep the climate planning process on track and it can help you, help you to meet targets. So before we go on, let me say a brief word about the role of inventories versus mitigation. Inventory tells you what your emissions are, but mitigation analysis tells you why your emissions are what they are and it can help you think about where you might be able to make reductions. So while high level data, for example, the fuel consumption in each sector may be sufficient for conducting greenhouse gas inventories, it cannot answer why the, why the fuel consumption is what it is. So this is really where mitigation comes in. And for mitigation, we need to make a more detailed analysis. 
we need to describe end uses. That's i.e. the reason that a society uses energy for various different purposes like cooking, lighting, transport, industry. And we also need to look into the technologies, the more or less carbon intensive technologies that might be available. So only then can we assess the scope for change. For example, by looking at demand reduction, energy efficiency, or switching to lower carbon or less polluting fuels. So let me turn now to the uh, LEAP software. LEAP is a Windows-based platform for energy climate mitigation and air pollution abatement. And we've been developing it over the last 30 years at the Stockholm Environment Institute. It's been very widely applied, basically in almost every country in the world. And at least 38 countries used it to help develop their first national communications to the Paris Climate Agreement. It's a scenario-based modeling tool and it's used to explore how emissions may change in the future under alternative policy settings. For example, comparing a policy neutral baseline scenario uh, to scenarios that look at particular mitigation measures or overall low emission development strategies. LEAP is typically used at the national scale, but it has also been applied at the city scale or even for multi-country analyses. And it's been quite widely applied both in Latin America and in a number of Caribbean countries. LEAP is not just for modeling, but it supports many of the tasks that go on throughout the climate planning process. So in particular, it can help you with data management and documentation. It can help you visualize results. And it can also be a useful tool when it comes time to do stakeholder engagement. So it's not just about modeling and algorithms. So what are the, some of the key advantages of LEAP? Well, maybe most important, it's readily available and relatively easy to use. And it's free for government, for low income and lower middle income governments, NGOs and academia. So for most of Caribbean countries, it would be freely available. LEAP reflects more than 30 years of thinking about how developing countries need to assess their energy, climate, air pollution strategies. I think it's one of the only energy modeling tools that was designed right from the get-go for application in developing countries. LEAP encourages users to take a very demand-driven approach, so it really puts development at the heart of climate planning. It's really thinking about basic needs first and how those can be met through different energy end uses and technologies. LEAP covers both demand and supply and all greenhouse gases and it also allows you to think about costs and benefits of strategies and its structure is very closely aligned with standards such as the IPCC greenhouse gas uh, inventory methodologies but also things like the IEA energy balance format. So it should be very familiar to people working both in energy ministries and environmental ministries. Some of the more recent developments in LEAP are very useful think for thinking about co-benefits, in particular thinking about the, uh, the health impacts of premature mortality caused by air pollution. But there's also other elements in LEAP which let you think about sustainable development co-benefits. The structure of the software is pretty flexible. It has very low initial data requirements, so it's easy to get started in situations where there's not so much data available or maybe where expertise in an institution is fairly limited. There's not so many people working in the institution, but it's also powerful enough that you can grow with it over time. So it does have some pretty sophisticated methodologies available once the data or the expertise available improves. As I mentioned already, it's a complete decision support system. It's not just about modeling. It's also about helping you with tasks like data management, results visualization, and stakeholder engagement. And really, the whole software is designed to speak the language of decision makers, planners, and stakeholders. It's not designed primarily to speak the language of modelers. It's designed to speak the language of en energy policy practitioners. The software is very professionally supported. So we have online forums, we have training exercises, we have videos, and overall there's a very vibrant community of users. More than 45,000 people are members of the LEAP website in basically every country. And there's a very large number of people available to help anyone who's using it.
So I don't have time in this presentation to go into a great amount of detail about Leap, how Leap works. I would invite you to have a look at the uh, Leap YouTube channel, which has a lot of videos showing how to use the software itself. But let me just mention something briefly about the idea of scenarios in Leap, because that's very important. So scenarios are consistent and plausible stories about how an energy system might evolve over time. So they're really key in LEAP and they're used for policy analysis, but they can also be used for looking at sensitivities. In LEAP, we have this concept of inheritance. Inheritance allows you to create hierarchies of scenarios that inherit default values and default expressions from their parent scenarios. And this approach is very useful in helping you to minimize data entry and to streamline data management. So for example, a policy scenario might be very similar to a baseline scenario, except in the places where you're implementing the particular policy. It might inherit a lot of the underlying macroeconomic and demographic projections, for example. They might be common to both scenarios. We also have this concept of multiple inheritance. So multiple inheritance allows scenarios to inherit from more than one parent scenario. So the really cool thing about this is that you can create individual mini scenarios reflecting particular policies or particular measures, and then you can group those together to make overall strategies or overall integrated scenarios. And I'll show you uh, how that works in a moment, but it's a very powerful way of doing scenario modeling. The scenario manager screen, which you can see up on the top right of this screen, is the place in Leap where you can organize your scenarios and specify the inheritance structure. So you can see there I've got a baseline scenario, but I've also got sort of individual policy measures. For example, the T1, T2, T3, those are individual measures within the transport sector. Then I've got a, a scenario called uh, TRA, the transport package, which is a combination of those individual measures. And then I can even package up the transport package along with other scenarios in order to make an overall integrated scenario. That might reflect, for example, my overall mitigation scenario. So a typical LEAP model will include at least one baseline scenario, or these days those tend to be referred to as without measures scenarios. Plus, you'll probably create at least one more alternative scenario. For example, you might create a with existing measures scenario that reflects the policies and measures that are already being enacted in the country. And you, then you might have an additional measures scenario, which is looking at the measures that you're thinking about uh, enacting in the future. Scenarios can also be used to track progress in implementing of measures. So for example, you might look at measures that are already implemented, measures that are sort of currently being planned but haven't yet been implemented. And maybe you have another sort of category of measures that are just being are currently under discussion but haven't yet been planned in detail or implemented. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. And then finally, I'd also mention that measures can also be analyzed individually and used to generate marginal abatement cost curves in LEAP. So leap, leap, marginal abatement cost curves can help you to prioritize measures within an overall strategy. And you can see the, the chart on the bottom right there is one of the outputs of a LEAP model, and it's showing you the cumulative abatement of different measures on the x-axis versus the cost of the measures on the y-axis. So you can see some of the measures have negative costs and, and some level of abatement. And some of the measures, the ones over on the right, are the expensive measures. And they have a positive cost relative to the baseline. So that's a very common chart used in helping to prioritize which policies and measures you want to include in your overall mitigation scenario. Okay, for the last part of this talk, I just want to very quickly demonstrate how you can use LEAP itself. And in particular, I want to show you how you could use the scenarios in LEAP to keep track of the implementation of the measures you're thinking about. So this might be an area where LEAP might be useful in helping you do your, your MRV process, your measurement reporting and verification process. So what we have here is an example model. This is uh, just a demonstration with fictitious country 
data in it. But you can see the, the here we're in the analysis view of Leap, which is the place where we create the model, where we put in all the data and where we create the scenarios that we're interested in. This has a very typical structure. Here we've got energy demand broken down into the major sectors, residential, industry, transport services, agriculture, non-energy, and then bunkers. And then we have what we call transformation. That's where you deal with the conversion of energy from primary into secondary and final energy forms. So there we have sectors like transmission, distribution, electric generation, oil refining, coal mining, natural gas and oil extraction, that kind of thing. Finally, we have a resources section where we say what's the availability of our fossil fuels and what's the sort of the annual availability of our renewable energy forms. And then we have a non-energy sector where we deal with non-energy related greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see the structure is very similar both to the sort of energy balances that ministries of energy produce or the IEA produces, but the structure is also very similar to the standard accounts used in the IPCC inventories process. So let's look at um, some scenarios that we can create. So here I'm gonna click on the scenarios button and here you can see we've got what's always we start out with something called the current accounts. The current accounts is the place where we put in the base year data or it might even be multiple years of historical data. So the current accounts is where you put in a whole set of data about sort of current energy consumption and production and current emissions. That, so that's the place where you're going to really connect up with what you've done in your inventory process. And it's very important to make sure that your current accounts in your LEAP model are very well calibrated to your inventory process. Here then we also have a baseline scenario. We can see in this particular model, we have what we call the old baseline. So this is what we thought the baseline was going to be last year, but we've had to make some dramatic uh, changes to that to reflect the impact of COVID-19. So it can be very useful to do sort of a before and after th to think about what the impacts of COVID-19 might be and to think about what kind of policies might make sense given the impact of COVID. Then underneath that, we've got, you can see down here at the bottom, we've got all sorts of very detailed policies and measures. So some of them are transport measures, some of them are electric supply generation measures, some of them are residential measures. We've even got some industrial measures down here. So each one is a sort of pretty detailed uh, policy or a pretty detailed technology oriented measure. So it's as detailed as thinking about, for example, you know, what might be the efficiency of air conditioners or the efficiency of lighting, or, you know, maybe we want to switch between uh, gasoline to electric motorcycles or cars. So each of these are individual measures. And then here we've got three different mitigation measures and I've called them implemented implemented and planned and implemented planned and under discussion so the implemented ones are the ones it's like kind of the existing measures those are the measures that we've already put in place in the country uh, the implemented and planned are the implemented measures but also ones that we've already got pretty detailed plans to put in place and then the third one the under discussion are really sort of the the measures that we're thinking about but there's no detailed plans yet and you can see if I click on one of those here under implemented, under inheritance, you can see the implemented includes these five measures from the detailed list of measures. So these are the ones we've already done in this demonstration country. The implemented in planned includes all of those measures plus some others that are now already being planned in detail. And then the implemented planned and under discussion is basically all of the policies and measures we're thinking about. So it's a big long list. So you can see each one is more inclusive than the previous one. So the nice thing about having these three bins is that we can very easily move these policies and measures. So once something gets implemented or once it goes from under discussion to being planned, we can move it from one of these boxes into the into the other. So it's quite a nice way of keeping track of the different policies and measures you're thinking about and keeping track of how well you're doing in terms of implementing your policies and measures and implementing your overall mitigation strategy. So those three mitigation scenarios there are basically different combinations of all these different detail measures down below. So let's look at how that works. Let's look at the results view in LEAP. 
and I'm just going to initially look at greenhouse gas mitigation measures uh, and compare the, those four different or five different scenarios that we've created. So here now we see the results and here I'm plotting total greenhouse gas emissions in millions of metric tons. I've got the years on the x-axis and then I'm plotting the scenarios as line charts on the y-axis. So you can see the top line is my old baseline. So that's how I thought my emissions were going to grow before the COVID crisis kicked in. The orange line is my COVID-19 baseline. So you can see there's a big discontinuity caused by the economic crisis of COVID. So it brings us all the way back down here, but then continues to grow thereafter. Then we have our, our, our three different policy measures. So first of all, we have the implemented measure. So those are the ones we've actually done. And you can see they haven't made a, a big dent relative to the COVID-19 baseline. The ones that we were at planning, those will make a bit more of a dent, but the ones where we're the ones which are under discussion can make a really significant dent. They can actually cause the emissions to stop growing and more or less level out, which in a rapidly growing developing country would be quite a big achievement. So let's look at a few more detailed charts. So I'm going to change some of the options here in the results view to pick some different results. So in particular, let me focus in on the electric generating sector. And I'm going to show those results, not across all scenarios, but here in the legend, I'm going to say I want to look at those results by branch or by the, the uh, electric generating process. So here I'm looking at results for the old baseline, but let's look at what happened under the COVID baseline. So you can see there the emissions are going up and you can see the generation mix in the old baseline was expected to be very fossil dominated. There's a lot of growth in combined cycle. There's a lot of coal still existing and a lot of old oil steam turbines. Let's have a look at our most ambitious scenario, our, our under discussion scenario. So you can see there, there's, there's still, the emissions are still dominated by the combined cycle, but let's look at the actual generation to see what kind of power plants are being generated here. So instead of G, the GWP, I'm going to look at the generation. Let's put that in a better unit. Let's put that in gigawatt hours. So you can see there's the, the here now you can see there's still a lot, lot of combined cycle, but there's a lot more of the renewable generation. So there's a bit more hydropower. There's a bit, uh, a lot more solar PV and there's quite a lot of geothermal as well. So as a result of that, the emissions are significantly lower. And actually we can plot how much we've avoided by selecting up here, the avoided versus the baseline scenario. So you can see the dotted line there is the emissions that we avoided in that scenario. So I could show you thousands of other reports, but I don't have time today. So I hope that when we get to discuss in person, there'll be some questions about this. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your time.